Welcome to China in Focus. I'm Tiffany Meyer. In today's special episode, we sat down with Arthur Herman, senior fellow at the Hudson Institute and director of the Quantum Alliance Initiative. While microchips have been making the rounds in news headlines, there's a recent report by the Center for Security and Emerging Technology at Georgetown University titled Managing the Chinese Military's Access to AI Chips. But what are AI chips and what happens if China's military gets a hold of these? Let's dive in. Arthur, thank you so much for joining us. Great to have you back on the show. It's always a pleasure to be here. So microchips right now are big in the news. They kind of run everything from our phones, computers, to even fighter jets. But there's a new report out by the Georgetown University Center for Security and Emerging Technology. And it kind of talks about China's military that's accessing U.S.-made AI chips. So to begin, what is an AI chip and how is it different from regular microchips? Well, it's different in terms of having very specific properties um, that that make it extremely useful for people who are setting up uh, AI applications or machine learning applications. Um, so let's talk about what makes an AI chip. An AI chip, uh, and there are really basically three types um, of, of microchips that are uh, not exclusive to AI applications, but which are extremely useful for them. First one are graphic processing units, GPUs. Now, that's true for if you're making movies, it's true for a whole range of other applications. But since so much of what happens with AI is about, let's say, visual recognition, uh, the, the use of graphics, the use of images, um, uh, advanced uh, graphic processing units are extremely useful for that um, and, uh, and an important part of your, of your AI driving package. Uh, the second type are what are called uh, application-specific integrated circuits. And they're ba basically what you have is the applications contained in the chip itself. In other words, you don't run the program through a series of other chips, you know, random access memory or, uh, or, or digital processing units. You're, it's, it's actually contained in the chip itself. Not just AI, but it could be other types of applications. Then the third type, which is a real mouthful, is what they call field programmable. Uh, gateway arrays. And these are chips that basically you can program to fit into uh, a specific set of commands that drive an application of one sort or another. In other words, you can it's like a blank slate. You could put in the program that you need into it so it runs that program specifically uh, when you need it uh, and when it's required. So all of these chips, basically what they do are they're accelerants. They accelerate the running of AI applications and machine learning programs. Arthur, how does the Chinese regime kind of speed up this process? You mentioned earlier that AI needs vast amounts of data. So where is China getting all that data from? Well, one of the places is we're learning is from TikTok. We've talked, you and I have talked about TikTok in the past and about the worries that uh, have been recently expressed um, about the dangers of TikTok and of Chinese access to U.S. data, uh, the data from U.S. users. But that's a classic example. Again, TikTok doesn't, people using TikTok don't convey classified data or sensitive data uh, or the kinds of things that we usually think about when we think about people stealing secrets, right, or getting, getting information about an antagonist. But what it does do is provide more data more information about how Americans behave and how, they, how TikTok users and their friends and their likes and dislikes all feed into an overall picture of what Americans are doing and about how Americans and uh, uh, Americans make decisions and and where the where the stress points are in American society that China needs to be aware of. And again, one of the things to bear in mind is is that machine learning programs, right, the grist of the mill for this. Um, the more data they get, the more accurate they become. And so if you've got an AI chip, which allows you to speed up the process so you can move through the data faster and faster, that's a big advantage. You know, a good way to think about this, Tiffany, is to think about it like making coffee, okay? Um, imagine, right, the difference between having to crush the beans, right, heat it, boil the water, pour it into the, into the French press, press it down. It's a long, drawn-out process. That's the case with, let's say, running a machine learning program on regular chips. 
Now contrast this time that it takes to do all of that to make a pot of coffee compared to using a Keurig, right? The single coffee bullet. You just drop it in, close the lid, push the button, boom, you've got your cup of coffee. It's the same coffee. It's exactly the same result, but so much faster and so much more e economy of time and, uh, and effort. And that's exactly what those AI chips represent. They're the Keurig, they're the Keurig solution for speeding up your AI and machine learning applications to give you the information that you need to make important decisions. And in China's case, important decisions on how to, how to advance their interests vis-a-vis -vis the United States. And on that note of, say, how China gets these chips, Arthur, it seems this report notes that out of the 97 individual AI chips they were able to track down that the PLA purchased China's military, they all came from U.S. companies. So on that note, are there export control laws? How is this happening that we're kind of funding China's military? Well, export control laws are complicated because it isn't just the Chinese who buy these chips. Um, and you don't want to be in a situation in which you sort of say, okay, we're not going to sell these chips anymore uh, to China, uh, and we don't want to make sure that no one else sends them to China either or resells them or repackages them in any kind of way to, uh, to the Chinese military uh, or to Chinese intelligence services or even Chinese universities because whatever it is they get, the government says that's ours and they'll help themselves to it. So you don't want to be in a situation where you're uh, denying uh, friendly countries or even neutral countries, chips that are part of their perfectly legitimate AI applications and the way in which they work in the commercial area or in the government. I mean, AI is a, it's a, it's an ever-present technology now. Everybody's got programs. Everybody's got companies that work in the AI, in the AI space today. Um, but on the other hand, you do recognize the fact that because China is so dependent on U.S. sources, because China is so far behind in developing their own microchip industry in general, it's really just in the beginning process of trying to build a domestic microchip industry. They're way behind countries like the United States, like Japan, like Taiwan. Um, but you also got a situation in which um, these particular chips, they're entirely dependent on the U.S. So what do you do? Do you cut them off as a way in which to limit their AI programs and their use of this technology against us? Or do you leverage that dependence in ways that can help with sort of gaining more advantage with regard to China uh, and our dealings with China in a, in a much broader way as well? You provide a linkage between if you want these types of advanced check chips, we're going to expect improvements in these areas, in areas of uh, stay away from Taiwan, uh, don't buy Russian oil during the war in Ukraine, um, uh, l let us monitor your human rights abuses in your factories um, and, uh, and, and in your in assembly plants, um, all those other kinds of things. This, is, this could be important leverage. Uh, at the same time, we don't want to have uh, China taking advantage of poor export laws and using our own technology against us. That's a nightmare that no American policymaker and no American should want to have happen. And on the note of, say, national security, the FBI and MI5 recently just had an unprecedented joint conference saying how China's the biggest threat. The FBI opens about a new China-related case every 12 hours. But it sounds like in regards to this particular area, the U.S. is ahead of China in a way. So what can the U.S. do to really keep that from slipping to China, that lead? Well, I think when we were talking about specifically about the area of AI chips, I would say number one is we've got to alert our allies also to this problem and make sure that, that when we do sell uh, AI chips to them and to other countries, that the end user doesn't wind up being China. The second, uh, the second requirement I think that we really need to address in this is to think about our own AI policy and what, where we're going with this. Because one of the things, and we've talked about this before, Tiffany, one of the things that, that we, we have to immediately realize is, is that China is not only way ahead of us in terms of developing AI as an important tool for government and for uh, understanding its antagonists, 
its main antagonist, namely the United States, they're also thinking about AI as an important technology in a strategic way. And we need to spend more time thinking about that as well. And to understand that AI can be a very powerful, positive tool for American and for American life, that we can protect privacy, which is a key issue, in particular with regard to, let's say, what's happening with TikTok data and other data that China could have access to under, under uh, current conditions, but that we can protect uh, privacy, but we can also advance our national interest by using this technology in ways that can give us uh, a much better understanding of what China is doing, uh, a much better understanding of a whole range of problems and issues where this is a technology just waiting to be to be applied and put to use. So I guess in the end, what I'd really like to see is to see our AI chip uh, sector being something that we come to understand how important it is for our own AI industry and development of that and progress in that technology at the same time and realize just how valuable these little tiny microchips really are for for our understanding of the future. And Arthur, on that note, how valuable these little chips are, it seems AI especially needs data. So how can the U.S. then also ensure we're not losing all of our data to China and in a way helping an adversary? I think we're going to have to start thinking about data in a different way. And I think right now we think about it as something which is a kind of byproduct of transactions of all kinds, whether it's transactions on our phones or whether it's business transactions or data that's simply generated about you know, uh, everyday activities such as traffic patterns, um, what uh, airline flights, uh, all of that kind of thing, that the data is a kind of byproduct that we pack up and store away uh, and wait for some day in which we can sort of uh, you know, throw some of it away, clean it out as it gets to be old and obsolete. It's the wrong way to think about data. We've got to start thinking about it as a commodity, as a good, the way we would talk about any other kind of commodity. And we have to think about that when we send out data into the world, we have to think about who's getting that data, who has access, unlimited access to that data, and what use are they making of that data. And it's something that we should be thinking about all the time. Again, not just individually as a matter of privacy, but also as a nation, because that data ha can become a tool to be used against us. And the Chinese are proving that every day. So thinking about export control, not just for our AI chips, but export control for our data, I think it's time for that discussion to get underway in Washington, DC, and for us to really think seriously about how we export data and who does the exporting, where it goes, who has access to, as an important part of our national of our national security as well as our economic security uh, agenda here. You know, the Department of Commerce has an entire list, it's called the U.S. Munitions List, of commodities and products which can't be sold to certain kinds of countries, including China, because it's considered too dangerous to do so. Well, I think the time has come for us to think about putting certain types of data on such a list and say this is data which does not leave our country, does not leave our shores. Uh, because it is important, not just classified and, s and sensitive, but also because it has, it is this, it's this valuable grist for AI mills that are turning 24-7 in China, in Russia, and other, other hostile countries uh, that's being used against us. And Arthur, any last words you'd like to add? Well, I think Again, it's important for us to think about these issues in terms of the larger overarching one, and that is that data has become the new strategic commodity of the 21st century, that it will be as, as important and as decisive in who is it that prevails in the, in the geopolitical contest between the United States and China, between the free world and, the, in the, and, and, the, and what I call the new axis, China, Russia, Iran, and North Korea. Uh, it'll be as decisive as uh, coal and steel was in the wars in the 19th century and as fossil fuels were decisive uh, in the wars in the 21st, 20th century and in our own era. It's the future strategic commodity. We need to think about that and plan for it. Um, otherwise, uh, we're, these, the, we are going to find ourselves in a very serious situation where 
a technology we originated. Machine learning and artificial intelligence comes out of American labs and American companies is used decisively against us by our worst enemies. That's not a situation we want to be want to be caught up in. And we need to think about that in a very serious way starting now. Arthur, thank you so much for joining us. Great to have you on the show. Happy to be back again. That was Arthur Herman, senior fellow at the Hudson Institute and director of the Quantum Alliance Initiative. And for those watching our full episode, joining us after the break, David Goldman, deputy editor for Asia Times. He touches on what steps need to be taken to ensure the U.S. doesn't lose the lead when it comes to advanced microchips, the difficulties involved, and more. Our full episode is available on our partner platform, Apoc TV. To sign up, click the link down below. Thanks for watching China in Focus. I'm Tiffany Meyer, and see you soon.